Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to the second edition of the Orient City Literature Festival, which is being organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I am Samarth Khurana, your anchor for this session. The session is 40 minutes long, and the topic for today's session is Why is my hair curly? So, on this pleasant morning, it is my privilege to introduce Lakshmi Ayer, ma'am, as the speaker for the session. Ma'am is a banking professional and an author. She loves writing at night when her children are in bed. An MBA, gra an MBA graduate from the Libu School, Libu College of Business, and an alumna of the Yale Writers Workshop. She writes creative nonfiction on her blog. Her work has appeared in several magazines, such as the Huffington Post, Chicago Now, Adoptive Families, Centered Magazine, and the verb. She hopes to publish a memoir of her adoption journey someday. When ma'am is not working or writing, she enjoys cooking and watching random food videos on YouTube. She lives with her husband and has three daughters near Philadelphia in the U United States. We welcome you, ma'am, handing this session over to you. Hi, thank you, Samar. Yes, ma'am. Hi, everybody. Um, who has joined. Thank you for spending and allocating your time for me. Today I'm here to talk about my debut no novel, um, Why Is My Hair Curly? Um, this book is by Westland Books and um, obviously I wrote it but it's illustrated by Nilofar Vadia and she has done a phenomenal job of illustrating this book and um, this book is about a girl Avantika who has curly hair obviously and uh, so, and like the way this is about a brother and a sister who are adopted at birth um, by their parents. And then the, the whole story is about how Avantika comes to terms with her hair. I'm just gonna share like a couple of um, illustrations here. So you can see like the illustrator has really brought out the nuance of the characters that are like, you know, almost every, every illustration in this book. Um, it's a favorite of mine. So how I'm going to approach this session is I'm going to be reading an excerpt from the book for a little bit. Then I'm going to break it up into topics. Um, I've done a, a bunch of webinars for kids between ages eight and 12. And some of the questions that often come up are, you know, why this book? Why did you write this book? Why this title? And then, um, some some kids are curious about, you know, what the adoption storyline in the book is about. Um, so often we talk about representation, what that means, uh, and why we need diverse books. Um, so I will be touching upon some of those topics, depending on time, obviously. Um, and then I will end my session with a few words of advice for writers, young and old. So having said that, I am going to um, read an excerpt. I invite any of you who have questions to type it up in the chat box. And if we have time, maybe we can have like a mini Q&A at the end. Um, if not, I will also leave my contact um, um, details at the end of this um, session so you can reach out to me. I'm just gonna start from the beginning of the book, maybe read a couple of um, pages, okay? So this book again is Why Is My Hair Curly? And the first chapter is titled All Vacations Come to an End. We both get window seats, said Avnish, his face lit up with joy as he surveyed the seats of the Shatapti coach they were in. While he stood figuring out which one he wanted, Avantika put her backpack down on the seat that had its back to the direction they were able to travel in. She loved the feeling of being pulled backwards, of having no idea where she was going. Also, she hated the wind that got in her face and messed up her already unruly hair. Amma had tied a scarf around it for good measure. Avantika also looked, loved looking at the passenger charts they stuck on the coach before people boarded. She would look at the names of people who would sit near them and always wished there were, uh, that there would be other children she could make friends with. This time too, they were out of luck. The others on the list seemed like an older couple who had requested aisle seats. Amma and Appa were busy putting away their suitcases and the humongous boxes that Patti and Tata, their grandparents, had packed for all of them. They were filled with vadam or sun-dried friams, 
Palaparam, also called jackfruit, Mavadu, the baby mango pickle special to Coimbatore, and loads of bakshanam, a mix of sweet and savory snacks to share with friends once they reached home. It was not that they could not get what they wanted in Chennai, but Party always liked to make a fuss of her son and his family when they visited. Look, Chitapa and Tata are here, Avantika pointed to her Appa's younger brother and father. They were making their way through the aisle towards them. Here's something for you, Kutis. Chitapa's eyes twinkled as he held out a bag each for them. They were crammed full of chocolate bars and cream biscuits, just the things they loved during a long train journey. Avantika flew into her Chitapa's arms when he held them out. Avnish joined her and they stayed like that for a bit before Tata reminded them that it was almost time for the train to leave. Avni, aren't you going to eat your chocolate? I can eat it for you if you like, Avantika teased, knowing it would distract him from feeling sad when the train left. It worked as Avnish unwrapped his chocolate bar and scarfed it down before Avantika could even unwrap hers. The train started moving slowly, picking up speed as it pulled out of the station. Avantika peered out of the window until the station disappeared from view. The end of vacation was always sad. Can you stop at this point? This is like the run of the mill vacation. Any of you who've been, you know, um, to visit your grandparents uh, for the summer, probably even like, you know, um, uh, just, just visiting any family and, um, for any break. And if you've ever taken the train to visit your family, you're probably familiar with um, the kind of things that Avantika and Avnish experience in this book. Um, I chose to read the first few um, pages for a reason. Um, and before I delve into why, um, some of the questions I get are like, you know, why did I write this book for one? Um, and then, you know, why is this book about a girl with curly hair? And why was this title, um, Why Is My Hair Curly? So to kind of give you a little bit of background, um, I grew up in um, Coimbatore in Chennai, which is where the book is set. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s India. I had extremely curly hair and um, Coimbatore was not so bad, but when we moved to Chennai in the 80s, um, the Chennai weather would make my hair frizz up. So every evening I would have this nice halo um, no matter, you know, how much oil my mom put on my hair or uh, no amount of grooming could literally, you know, could tame it down. I was bullied for that. I have always been a fat child. I was bullied for that. It took me up until I was in my mid 40s um, to figure out, you know what, it doesn't matter. You are who you are. And a lot of this book kind of goes into the larger themes of acceptance about self-worth about identity and what it is like to, you know, accept yourself for who you are. Um, so th that, is, that is one of the things. So why me? You know, why should I write this book? Um, like many of you who are watching, hopefully, um, I was a kid who loved to read. Sports was not my thing. You know, cricket was not my thing. But every day at, you know, um, like even before school started, I was this kid who would read her English and non-detailed books cover to cover multiple times. I was this girl who would go with my hands in the air for every question that was asked. Um, reading came very naturally to me. And because I read so much, I also used to write. So I had uh, my tata, my grandfather, uh, who would give me at the beginning of the year, I don't know if any of you, have, this is probably pretty old school for you, but um, when I was little, every um, at the beginning of every new year, banks and businesses would give out these calendars and um, diaries like you know with date and you had space to put in for there would be one page for each date so any of the older diaries so, so if it was 1985 say my tata would give me all the diaries that he didn't use for 1984 so I, I started um, this habit of journaling I didn't know it was called journaling at the time I would just write what I felt and I um, that was how I fell into writing so Every time I would be mad at my uh, mom, I would write. If my brother teased me, I would write. If I got bullied at school, again, it was not called bullying then, um, probably teased. You know, the terms vary, but not much has changed between when I was a school kid. And now I have three daughters who are in like, you know, a couple of them are in middle school. 
and I have one in elementary school. And many of the things that they deal with are pretty much the same. And it boggles my mind. You know, you would think after 40 years, things would have changed. Well, not really. Um, so because of the kind of experiences I had growing up and the kind of experience I have as the mother parenting three girl children, um, there are a lot of things I want to talk about. So when this opportunity came to me, again, because I write, I, I run a blog, um, it's a personal blog, and the publisher um, read my blog, she liked my write of, um, style of writing, and she said, hey, I'd like for you to write a children's book for me. And I said, hey, I really don't write fiction, I write a lot of narrative nonfiction, but she said, why don't you give it a shot? So um, not many of us who write get opportunities like this. So I thought about, you know, what are the things that I want to write about? And I believe I'm um, somebody who writes from experience. I write best when I don't have to think about it. So a lot of my what is in the book is about a girl who loves to read, a girl who loves to write. There's an um, adoption storyline. My husband and I, we adopted children. Um, so, and then as a mother of three daughters who gets her kids ready for school every, every morning, there's a lot of, you know, fights over getting hair brushed. And especially if, I don't know if any of you are 12 years old or 11 years old, and you don't really like your mom brushing your hair in the morning and you think you can do it all. Uh, hello. Um, you know, that a lot of that happens at my house. So many of these struggles um, for me as a parent and as a child who was at the receiving end of these things made its way into the book. So and this is what we call writing from experience. You, the, the, another way of putting it is called having an authentic voice. And nowadays, the cool thing to say um, is to call it lived experience. And again, I'm not sure what the ages of the people who are watching this is, but if you are somebody who wants to write, wants to be a writer, this is probably a term you're familiar with. Um, and especially now, uh, we live in a very politically and racially charged environment. And there is a lot of discussion on what people should be writing, who should be telling the stories, and whose stories are we permitted to tell. So writing from your own experiences or writing experiences about which, you know, you can say, I have walked in those shoes, literally and figuratively, is a good way to start. And that way, you are writing from experience and you're kind of staying in your lane. Um, I'll kind of touch upon it later, but a lot of how this book came to be kind of stemmed from that. Then the next question I get from a lot of third and fourth graders is, uh, who came up with the title? It says, why is my hair curly? And if you look at the cover of the book, it has this girl with like, you know, really thick curly hair. She has a pencil in her hand and she has a journal. And there's like, you know, motifs all around um, the cover that represent going to school, like, you know, uh, hairdressing stuff, um, combs. There's like a book about grammar and history. Um, so a lot of the themes from the book are also represented in the cover. And a lot of um, my friends have said, you know, they were very intrigued. So one of the titles that I came up with was Avantika gets a haircut. How boring could that be, right? So then the publisher said, you know, why don't we, you know, make the title a question? You want um, your audience to really think about what is this book about? So you're walking in a bookstore, you see this, you know, nice green colored book with, you know, shiny font. And then it's a question that says, why is my hair curly? Anything that starts with a why makes you think. So I think the title works. And part of what the publisher does is to pick up titles that, you know, make want, readers want to pick up the book. Um, so that's a little bit of blurb about um, how the book came to be. Um, I want to kind of take a detour here and talk a little bit of personal stuff. So like I said, my husband and I adopted children. We, we live in the northeast, northeast of the U.S. We adopted twins when they were 10 months of age. They are white children with, you know, fine blonde hair. And then I have another child who is a lot like me and my husband. And she was born to me. And she has black, curly, unruly hair. And a lot of hair conversations involve, um, you know, why do Akkas get away with it? Or why should you braid my hair but not braid Akkas' hair? And I keep trying, you know, to tell my six-year-old that 
Akka's hair is fine and silky. If I braided it, it's not going to stay put. But you know what? So th these questions come and sometimes asking these why questions is a great way to think about all the ways that we can be different. And what, what does that mean? So in this book, the protagonist has curly hair. It's just a metaphor for something different. So, um, you know, so the, the kind of things that you can be different in could be based on your ethnicity, could be based on your gender, could be based on the way that you talk, the language that you speak at home, the kind of foods that you eat. Um, so all of these around the world, kids read books, but do, do all of us have the same environment? So again, I'm going to kind of hark back to my childhood. So as a child of the 70s and 80s, I read books. I used to read a lot of books. And you can see like the bookshelf behind me. There's like Enid Blyton. There's like, you know, Hardy Boys. And these days it's, you know, Ramona Quimby and Judy Bloom and, you know, a whole bunch. But one thing that's common is that protagonists are universally white. They have blue eyes. They have blonde hair. They have fair skin. Um, they eat bread, they eat scones, they use clotted cream. These were things I was not familiar with, but as a child, I let my imagination soar. I figured out what it was. I used the dictionary to look up meanings. And part of what we lose out when we read books that are homogenous in the sense that if they feature the same set of characters or the same type of people is that we don't get to have books that serve as portals. Now, for a child in India, in southern India of the 80s, these books were a portal to a world beyond that I had no clue. So growing up, I would literally lie on the terrace of my house, look up the sky and see planes flying overhead and think, one day I want to be on that plane. One day I want to go to this place that has bully words and drives and, you know, whatnot. Um, but why? are kids who are growing up in other countries not getting these portals to this wonderful world that is India. So that kind of, you know, then kind of touches upon what is diversity in literature? What do, uh, what kind of books do I want to write? And some of that comes from me looking for books for my children. For my older two, it's very easy for me to pick, pick any random book from the library and they'll see themselves represented. They'll see um, white protagonists, white um, doctors, professors, engineers. Um, they have what they call racial mirrors in the books. So it's easy for them to, be, to imagine themselves as writers, as lawyers, and whatever characters that they see in the books that they read. Whereas for my child of color, unless she is fed a steady diet of books that involve people that look like her mom and dad, talk like her mom and dad, or do things in a way that represents her. It's hard. For, it's going to be hard for her to see herself um, in 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 the art that surrounds her. So part of the reason when I wrote this book, it was a very intentional and conscious decision to include a lot of vernacular. So if you ever read this book or you intend reading this book, be aware that I, I use the terms Amma and Appa liberally. So my characters, Avantika and Avnish, call their mother and father Amma and Appa. They call their grandparents Pati and Tata. They have Chittapa and Chitti. They, you know, eat idlis and dosas and chutneys and rava kesari and puri and alu. So, you know, these are the kinds of foods I cook at home and my children eat. And I'd love for children to look up the word Rava Kesri and find out what this dish is. If I can find out what a uh, scorn is at the age of 10 or 12 sitting in South India, I'm sure any child across the world should be able to find out what Rava Kesri is, should they be inclined. But they're not going to be able to do that unless we give them an opportunity to do that. So, that, so part of that representation in books and, and the fact that we need diversity in terms of how we portray the characters in books. Kind of stems from that need. There was this need that I saw that I wanted to fill and the book is kind of an outcome of that.
Then I also want to talk about what um, there's this really famous TED talk by Chima Manda, Manda Adichie, and she talks about the dangers of a single story. And it's it's a wonderful talk if you haven't heard it. But what what it basically says is that if if all the stories about a particular kind of people are the same, then any reader or any listener listening to those stories walks away with a unidimensional view of a particular set of people. So in this case, I'm taking India as a monolith. Again, we all know India is not a monolith. People from the East and the West and the North and the South are not equally represented. And we all know that we are far more likelier to understand what mama and papa are than amma and appa. We are far more uh, you know, likelier to understand chacha and chachi than chitti and chitapa. So that's the danger of a single story. We want you know, stories from every walk of life to make it to bookshelves so kids can see themselves in it. So a lot of it kind of ties together, but I am extremely glad and you know happy that the publisher gave me this opportunity to tell the story the way I wanted to tell it. And that then kind of brings me to the next topic. And this is something a lot of kids that I talked to over, um, it, it just in the past month, I've spoken to close to a, about 500 kids in my children's school. So we d do these Q&A sessions over Zoom where I read to them and then there's like questions. And there's a lot of budding authors out there. And uh, one thing they keep asking is, how do I become a writer? Or how do I publish a book? So, and this is the list of things that I tell them, you know, um, never think of yourself as an aspiring writer. If you write, you're a writer, own it, you know, own it with pride. It doesn't matter how you write, you know, you can have spelling mistakes, you can have grammar errors, but those are things that can get fixed if you write and keep writing. So that kind of leads to the next, right? So it, to be a writer, you need to write a lot, you know, and when I, when I say write a lot, it means like every day every opportunity that you get in every form that you can, you know, using a paper and pencil, using your, you know, Word, Google Docs, the medium doesn't matter. So long as you get into the habit of putting your thoughts out and your stories out on paper. Again, to be a writer, you also need to read. You have to read a lot. You have to read across genres. You know, most of us have this thing about stick we like certain kinds of stories, we tend to repeatedly read the same kind of stories. While that's great, I think to be a writer, you need to be able to expand uh, the, the selection of books you read because then you kind of escape the pitfalls of a, the danger of a single story. Because now, when you alternate between fic, like contemporary fiction and science fiction and fantasy, it requires you to suspend your belief and be transported into a different world. Now that teaches you what's called world building. So when you create a story, you know, the whole world in which your characters reside, your characters and the worlds that they inhabit are much richer for the kind of books that you have read because all of that is now in your head. You know, you can kind of relate and say, hey, J.K. Rowling did this great in her Harry Potter, Potter series, or in Station Eleven, that particular section, you know, where there was exposition was amazing. So when you read a lot and read across genres, you can kind of draw inspiration from other writers, and it also expands your vocabulary. It does a lot of things. So net, net, write and read a lot, and that's the way to become a good writer. Just kind of want to check to see if there's anything else yes, I wanted to talk about. Um, and again, um, the other thing I would um, kind of wrap up saying is that always hold the long view. This is this process takes a long time. Uh, not everybody ends up with a book in the bookshelf with their you know name on the spine, but it doesn't make any of us any less writers. So the next thing would be to define success the way you want it. For me. It was about just the opportunity to get published. The numbers mean, yes, if the numbers are great, that's great. But just for me, just seeing my name on a book was enough. So you define success in the way that it, uh, you know, means something to you. And it doesn't have to be numbers. It doesn't have to be anything 
tangible. It could just be an image. And I say that because as a child of 10 or 12, I remember standing in a library in, 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 a, in, a, in a suburb of um, Chennai, um, kind of looking through the books and imagining, like literally imagining a book with my name on it. And that's an image I've held on to for a really long time. So there is power in visualization. There is power in having a goal that you're subconsciously working towards. So with that, I kind of end uh, my monologue. And if anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to take them. A lot. Basically, I have a personal blog. That's um, the web, the the website URL is lgir.com. So I started this blog when uh, I think Blogger had just come into being. So sometime around the 2004-2005 time frame, I was in my 30s then. You know, I was newly married. I was an immigrant in a new country. So even before that, I used to journal on like in notebooks and like notepads and stuff like that but that was the first time i was putting my work out in public and the fact that i used to write about you know what it is like to uh, work in a foreign country or what it is like to battle infertility without the support of a you know, family or when we went through the adoption process i kind of shared my entire journey with everybody and um that in turn like um, made a lot of people reach out to me and you know that with the community that has been incredibly supportive and I feel like because I've been writing since 2004 even though it was just personal blogs all that writing from 2004 on to 2019 kind of helped me become a better writer I can still you know I still have my struggles like I have um, trouble with tenses I keep switching to people uh, present and you know it's it, it's a mess but what I, what I've understood is that it's okay you get your first draft out revisit it revise and terrible at that but the good thing is publishers have a few people who can help you revise uh, and a second set of eyes definitely do help and most importantly that the community that you build like now I have a writing community that is extremely supportive I workshop my pieces with them so every time I have an article to publish somewhere um, it, it is directly a result of my writing and the community that you know put eyes on it and pointed out things that were not okay. So it's it's a group effort. It takes a village like everything else, um, and it takes like a lot of just putting yourself out there and to keeping at it. You know that grit and resilience. I think you like it. I had certain questions from the chat. Uh, have you seen impact of writing a children's book away from the character stereotypes? Yes, absolutely. That was something, again, so um, I didn't get into all the topics that the book deals with. So some of them, one of the core themes is adoption. As an adoptive parent, um, I have a very open adoption with my children's first parents. So. Uh, my children know who they were born to. They have access to them in the sense that they can chat with them on, on Messenger. We visit them, they visit us. So it's incredibly open. Um, however, I also have friends who have adopted from India. And um, much of the stories I hear about adoption in India is that openness is really not um, something that is common or easy. So it is not for the lack of trying. I, I have friends who really, given the opportunity, would love to have it for their children. Um, but any of the storybooks that I've read so far to my children that feature adoption um, have the same stereotypes. And, you know, there's usually this trope of parents saving children from difficult circumstances. Um, and which is where I struggle with it because really what, as, as adoptive parents, what you do is you're only giving children a different life, not, a, not necessarily a better life. But that's what is implied in all adoption stories. It's somehow like, you know, a child comes from a difficult circumstance and suddenly they have this better life. It's different, not better. And I would like to make that very clear. And the other thing is whether we like to accept it or not, most children who know they are adopted struggle with identity. Um, there is this thing called genetic mirroring. 
So even if you're adopted, if you're an Indian child adopted by Indian parents, um, you know, your nose looks a little different. Your, your facial features are different. Your skin color is different. Children know when they're adopted, whether you tell them or not. And they struggle to fit in. And, you know, especially uh, when you in your tweens and teens, the whole identity is built on understanding where you fit in the grand scheme of things. And this grand scheme starts with the unit that is the family. If you can't figure out your place in the family that you are in, it kind of then has a cascade effect. You struggle to find out your position in the larger narrative. And then, of course, you all, all, always want to know where you came from, who gave birth to you, what were the circumstances in which you were relinquished. So um, I think having those conversations. So in this book, Avantika talks about her birth mother a lot. She, she doesn't have access, but they have openness as in like her parents are extremely open with her and her brother. They know they are adopted. They go back to the orphanage from which they were adopted. And she keeps thinking if her curly hair is because it came from her birth mother. And the fact that her mother, her adoptive mother, has strugg struggles trying to manage and deal with curly hair, it makes her, leads her to wonder maybe her mom gave her up because of her hair. You know, at that age, you don't know what is it. But those questions are real. Those feelings are real. That need to know is visceral. And I think books... Uh, that kind of move away from stereotypes and take on complex and difficult things and make it accessible. So now when I have an adopted child of, say, 10 or 12 years old reading this book, it gives them a, a, a chance to validate that their feelings are real, that it's not just them. There are other kids who go, go through the same you know, struggles and have these same questions about birth family. And, and it's okay. So I think that's where we need, um, especially children's fiction, that take on things that break stereotypes. Um, indeed, this is true. This is all of this is true. Uh, we in India don't accept these uh, issues in the society publicly. So I think the book helps a lot in uh, making this a point in. Uh, children's head that it is okay to be slightly unfit. It is okay to have curly hair. It is yeah, okay to true. accept diversity in uh, starting from your early years in life. Mm -hmm. I had one more question from the chat. Uh, any advice for the viewers about self-image and writing from personal experiences? Definitely. So when I struggled with infertility, right? So again, this is not meant for children, but uh, when I struggled with infertility, I thought I was going through it alone. But when I put myself out on the blog, there was this entire group of people who reached out and said, you know what, I totally know what you're going through. I get it because I'm going through it myself. And thank you for writing about it because now I feel less alone. I feel like there is somebody else that is going through it. And it maybe it's not such a big deal to talk about it. So, And then I've also uh, had people reach out to me and say, I have family members going through it. I didn't know how hard it was on them. Thank you for writing about it because now I know that I should reach out and check on them. So writing and journaling, especially if you're doing it in a public sphere, has its, you know, it has its pluses and minuses. In my case, the pluses have far outweighed the minuses. Um, the amount of uh, people that I've met online who have gone on to become friends in real life um, is innumerable so and especially like spe uh, especially topics that carry stigma like infertility adoption um anything like depression uh, mental health especially in our culture we have trouble talking about that and and the truth is most families have one or more people going through it at any time just breaking those taboos and getting the conversation going i think is is one of the biggest benefits of writing and writing publicly I think with this, we have answered all the questions of the viewers. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this amazing talk. I'm sure the audience would have been delighted to witness all of this. And I thank also you thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I also thank your publisher, Red Panda, for all their help. On behalf of the Orange City Literature Festival, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. Also, special vote of thanks uh, to the audience for attending this event. Thank you, ma'am.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, same thing from me. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody, for whoever tuned in. Thanks. Twenty years of existence. Two universities. Twenty-three educational institutes. Offering 137 courses. Rai Sony Group of Institutions. A vision beyond.